And for those of you in the media, uh, out and about, uh, thank you for masking up. I also want to thank uh, folks who are tuning in from around the, the state today. Uh, I am joined today by a couple of outstanding leaders of the National Guard. Uh, we have uh, General Joseph Lingell, who serves as 28th Chief of the National Guard Bureau. He is a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, and he works out of Washington, D.C. He is visiting us today. Um, and he was here about four years ago, as I recall, uh, for a natural disaster when, when we had uh, flooding. But it, it's certainly a joy to welcome him back here. And I am especially appreciative of the work of the National Guard here in the state of Louisiana and around the country. And I can tell you, if there's one consistent theme uh, every time the governors get on the phone, whether it's with the president and the vice president or whether it's a governor's only National Governors Association uh, telephone conference, the one thing that, that every governor has in common is, is how excellent uh, their National Guards are performing. And that has a lot to do with General Lingell's leadership as well as just the quality of the, the guardsmen uh, and, and the uh, airmen, the, the soldiers and the airmen are around the country. And I'm really proud of the work that's being done here in Louisiana by our National Guard. And of course, we're, we're uh, uh, very familiar and accustomed in Louisiana to seeing our National Guard uh, perform uh, just tremendous service uh, in difficult circumstances. But this, this particular public health emergency is very different than what we've seen before. We've had more than our fair share of hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, you name it. Uh, but this uh, pandemic with the coronavirus is just very different. You should know that we now have over 1,425 soldiers and airmen assisting with the COVID-19 response. Um, but you probably don't really know what they're doing. Uh, and these are just some of the things that they're doing. Uh, they're, they're providing medical services. They're doing engineering assessments, uh, commodities distribution uh, and support, uh, managing our warehouse, uh, all of the ventilators, the PPE, and, and lots of other things flow through our warehouse. They're providing shelter assistance, traffic control point, drive-through testing, uh, site support, proper PPE training. They're assisting at food banks. Uh, they provide liaison officers to parish emergency operations centers. Uh, they did suitability assessments for different um, facilities all across the state of Louisiana as we were looking regionally to, to identify the best places to serve our medical capacity. Uh, they actually do work with LDH here uh, out of GOSEP on modeling uh, and, and so forth and many, many other functions. And so I want to thank uh, General Keith Waddell uh, for his leadership and all of the work that's being done by uh, the the soldiers and the airmen of the Louisiana National Guard. I've always said, and I, and I still say it, and I absolutely believe that we have the best in the business. Uh, General Lingell uh, cannot agree with that, and I, under I understand it, but I, but I know he, he understands just how good our National Guard uh, is. And they're not just good at disaster support and, and helping us to respond to these things. They're also good in their warfighting mission as well. Uh, we have over 100 soldiers uh, and airmen uh, who are deployed overseas right now. Uh, and by the end of this year, we will have 2,700 uh, deployed with the 256th Brigade uh, that, that will be going overseas. Uh, and so it's, it's a tough thing to manage, but they do a great job. But I can tell you this, the state of Louisiana today is a much better place than we would have been without the service of our National Guard. And, and I want to thank General Lingell for uh, supporting our efforts at a national level, uh, one of which is to get the Title 32 status extended beyond the initial 30 days, which will have tremendously positive impact on the individuals uh, who are serving uh, because of the additional benefits that they're now going to qualify for. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask General Lingell to come up and and deliver some remarks. And I'm gonna ask you all, if you have questions for him or for General Waddell about the National Guard, that you ask him uh, while he is at the podium, because I know that he has one more meeting and then he has to leave at, at 1.30, or as he would say, 13.30 hours, because he's gotta to get to another location. Uh, so if you would ask your questions of General Lingell uh, while he's at the podium, and then I'll come back at the conclusion of, of that portion of the press conference. General Lingell. Uh, Governor Edwards, thank you very much, sir, for the uh, great remarks and uh, rundown of what your National Guard is doing. And I'd like to add my uh, congratulations and thanks to uh, the, the Adjutant General, uh, 
uh, General Waddell, again, for his leadership of uh, one of the greatest National Guards in the United States of America, without a doubt. Um, so uh, thanks for letting me come see firsthand. And if I could just remind you, the entire de Department of Defense, including the National Guard, are trying to do a few things. One is uh, keep ourselves uh, safe and able to perform our missions. Um, so we want to protect ourselves. And as I've gone around Louisiana today and seen the care with which uh, the, the men and women are complying with CDC recommendations and, uh, and uh, social distancing to, to minimize the transfer and, and make sure that they're ready to do their missions and uh, so that we can respond uh, to the crisis as, uh, as our nation and as a governor, as Louisiana needs it to do. Um, let me just mention that uh, I have seen Louisiana National Guard uh, men and women all over the world. Um, most recently on my uh, trip uh, on Thanksgiving, I visited many of them in combat zones uh, in the Middle East. I've seen them in the Pacific. Um, they are world-class soldiers and world-class airmen. And, uh, and I, I, I don't think we could be um, any more proud of, of who they are and what they're doing. Um, notwithstanding, I, I want to share with you the enormity of this impact or of this event uh, on a National Guard scale. Um, you know, as of this morning, we had uh, 43,500 uh, National Guard members across the nation, um, including 1,200 here in Louisiana, um, that were uh, responding to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, these numbers are continuing to rise over the next week or so. We will cross uh, 50,000, I think, uh, men and women of the National Guard who are called uh, to duty for our nation by the governors uh, in their states. We have not had a, a response this large from the National Guard um, since 2005 and Katrina, when uh, we did have men and, men and women from every state and every territory participate in the events here in Katrina, more than 50,000. Uh, since that event. So this event uh, in every state, the difference being um, this is happening in every state, not just in the Gulf region, Louisiana, um, that's happening. So uh, we are, this is a, obviously a historic event and it, it's requiring a, a historic response. I need to just express my supreme gratitude and admiration uh, for the men and women who serve. Um, where our nation finds these men and women who will uh, both maintain their lives as civilian and yet uh, don this uniform as the governor need him, needs them or as the president needs them uh, to come to serve our country, uh, to come and serve our states and our, and our towns and our, and our homes, uh, it, is, it is something special. And um, we should be, as a nation, uh, among with the other first responders and those who are doing uh, the response in this thing, uh, very grateful. Um, we thank their families, we thank their spouses, we thank their employers who share them with uh, our nation to come when our nation needs them uh, to come away from their uh, civilian occupations. I thought that, uh, you know, the governor mentioned uh, Louisiana is no stranger uh, to needing the National Guard to respond here in the homeland. Condolences to the families who lost someone just in the tornadoes here in Louisiana just last night. Um, and uh, as, as the governor mentioned here uh, four years ago for floods, numerous hurricanes between then and now and uh, and the uh, the louisiana apparatus it is the hub as a national guard organization for where we bring together all of the nation every year uh, to plan for the all hazards type responses uh, that we have learned so much about uh, from responding here um, in, in this part of the country so not just tornadoes national guard members are on duty with cyber activities ransomware all the like the unique apparatus of what we're doing, not just soldiers or airmen, but we are guardsmen. And that special piece of the guardsmen that allows us to come to duty uh, when our governors need them uh, makes us special. And I think, uh, you know, I just would mention one last thing in closing is it's not what we do that, uh, it's not what we do that uh, in our military specialty that is so uh, always so valuable, but it's the innovation. It's, it's the skill sets that our members of the National Guard bring with them from their civilian lives into the tasks that the governor asked them to do when they put this uniform on, whether it's just in this warehouse that I, I just visited that uh, has on display uh, an innovative way to distribute high-value med high medical apparatuses around the state uh, at a moment's notice uh, should people need them. And whether it's uh, an infantry uh, man who's actually running a, a testing facility or whether it's, it's, uh, it's someone else that uh, has, has a, is a truck driver or, or uh, an intelligence officer that happens to be working in a, a food bank, which I came today from the Baton Rouge Food Bank to see that 2 million pounds of, of foods have been distributed to all the parishes here in, in Louisiana. 
It is a unique contribution. Um, and as, as military components go, the National Guard was built for this. And, and if you were going to design a component that could do both the warfighting mission and the domestic operation missions, you, you would invent uh, who we are and what we are doing today all across the nation and here in Louisiana uh, as the National Guard. So um, thank you all very much for, for uh, letting me say, and, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Nobody? Nothing. Let me off easy. Y'all saving up for me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. General, thank you so very thank much. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much for letting me come. Appreciate it. I you. appreciate it. Come back when we know I have a disaster. I will. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you, General. Thank you, General. Yes, sir. Before I get to today's COVID-19 numbers, um, and the general mentioned this, we did have two deaths uh, yesterday and, and overnight uh, that we believe were related to the severe weather. One of the deaths was in Rapides Parish, uh, likely the result of a tornado. The second was in DeSoto Parish, a victim of flash flooding uh, and individual drowned. Uh, we also had thousands of people who were left without power due to uh, the storms. Uh, numerous structures were damaged, some very severely, especially the LSU Ag uh, facility there in Alexandria, uh, which the main building appeared to be uh, destroyed. Uh, there was some damage as well at the mega shelter in Alexandria, which we used as a mass evacuation uh, shelter, for example, in a, in a uh, hurricane. Uh, it was not uh, damaged significantly, but we are going to have to do some work there ahead of hurricane season to make sure that it is fully operational. Of note, the severe weather actually continues today in southeast Louisiana as the storms push their way across the central Gulf Coast. Uh, so obviously our hearts go out to the families who were affected by the severe weather, especially those who, who lost a loved one. I know that people have a lot on their minds already with the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all going through. Uh, but I do continue to encourage all Louisianans to pay attention uh, to the weather today and going forward. Uh, watch your forecasts. Uh, pay attention to the notices and to the advisories. Uh, make sure that you've got your cell phone uh, where, where you can monitor it for, for warnings when, when there is an enhanced risk of severe uh, weather. And we've had a lot of inquiries about what we're doing to try to make sure that as we plan uh, for the hurricane season that starts on July 1st, uh, that we make sure that we're intentional and deliberate about how we approach this hurricane season uh, because of the posture we're in, which is very different uh, because of COVID-19. And we, we are going to have uh, exercises here at GOSEP working with all of the offices of emergency preparedness and all of our state agencies with the various emergency support functions uh, in an exercise uh, that will uh, be facilitated by the National Weather Service and so forth. And we, we fully plan to flesh that out and we'll do so in coordination with FEMA as well. Um, so I just every, ask everyone to continue to be uh, uh, mindful of the fact that the severe weather seems to be happening more frequently um, and with more severity. So please uh, pay attention uh, and get a game plan. Go to getagameplan.org uh, so that you can prepare yourself and your family it is more important than ever uh, that you that you prepare yourself and your family. You can go to getagameplan.org. It'll tell you how to do that. So shifting back now to today's COVID uh, update, uh, we are reporting 481 new cases today uh, for a total of 25,739. Uh, we're also reporting 67 new deaths, uh, very sadly which brings the statewide total to 1,540. General Lingell Ling spoke a moment ago about Hurricane Katrina. It's my understanding that the confirmed death count now uh, from this uh, coronavirus pandemic exceeds the death count that was attributable to uh, Hurricane Katrina, just for a little historical context there. Uh, we are reporting that uh, there are 1,727 COVID positive patients in our hospitals. That is a decrease of 20 from yesterday. Ventilator usage by COVID patients is 274. That's a decrease of 13. 
So it appears that cases have flattened and hospitalizations and vent usage uh, have decreased, and that's been pretty steady over the last several days. I do have some questions from the public before I get uh, to your questions. Uh, Mike from Jennings asked if I see the senior class of 2021 participating in fall sports at the start of the 2021 uh, school season. Um, look, I, I've said it before, I'm a, I'm a huge sports enthusiast. Uh, it's hard for me to envision a fall without football. And if for no other reasons than just being aspirational, it is my hope that we can do that. But I, I don't really have the ability right now uh, in April uh, to, to see that fall forward and know what the circumstances are going to be. Um, but I rest assured the Louisiana High School Athletic Association uh, with all of its member uh, principals, uh, will be making the best decisions they can about whether it's safe to resume athletics and if so, under what conditions. And what I, what I can say with some confidence is that in the event that we have fall athletics, whether it's high school or college or otherwise, it's not going to look exactly the same as it did last fall uh, because we, we fully expect that there will continue to be some social distancing requirements and and protective measures that, that we will ask individuals uh, to to exercise uh, for the for their benefit and the benefit of others uh, as well. Um, and the uh, Department of Education uh, will be working uh, on on exactly what the school year will look like, uh, working with the CDC uh, and others uh, at the Department of Health here in Louisiana uh, to make sure that they do what's in the best interest of our students that adequately protects public health uh, and safety. Uh, Rose from Napoleonville asks, is there medical assistance available for employees who've been laid off? Um, if you have lost your job or had your hours reduced and therefore your income reduced, um, you may be eligible for Medicaid now. Uh, after we did the Medicaid expansion, uh, that eligibility criteria is 138% is of the federal poverty level. So there are individuals out there who may not have been eligible before, but are eligible now. Uh, and you can apply uh, for Medicaid online at mymedicaid.la.gov. That's mymedicaid.la.gov. Or call 888-342-6207. That's 888-342-6207 to inquire about your eligibility. Uh, during the federal and state declared public health emergency, uh, Louisiana Medicaid is keeping members covered. Uh, current Medicaid members will not lose coverage for any reason other than their death, uh, permanently moving out of state, or requesting to have their coverage ended. Additionally, the federal stimulus check issued under the CARES Act will not impact Medicaid eligibility, so it will not count towards that uh, cap of 138% of the federal um, poverty level. So with that, I am going to open up for questions. Leo, in the back. Thank you, Governor. Um, Governor Cuomo in New York right now is giving his own press conference, and when he says an antibody test up there is proving that their numbers could be 10 times higher than what the official count is. At the same time, down the East Coast, the Georgia governor says he's going to lift the order in seven days under pressure. So are you going to bow to that same kind of pressure here and lift your order in seven days, or are you going to use Georgia as a guinea pig? Well, I don't, I don't accept the premise of the question about the guinea pig and so forth. Uh, we're, we're, we're planning to move forward uh, in Louisiana as we are able to, as we, if we meet the, the criteria, the threshold criteria, to move uh, into phase one. Uh, obviously, we would, I'm, I'm not making the announcement today because we've still got a ways to go, uh, but the current order expires on April the 30th. It would be nice to go to phase one on, uh, on May the 1st. We still are evaluating uh, whether we will meet the criteria uh, and exactly what that order is going to look like because, as you know, what the federal government has issued is, is a series of, of uh, guidelines as, as guidance. Um, and so we are, we're going to continue to move in that direction and we will know more soon, and, and uh, it would be my expectation uh, that at some point early next week, I have to tell the people of Louisiana what to expect by the end of the week, um, and, and that's when, when we'll have that announcement uh, to make. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, 
Uh, at the very least, our, our cases are flat and have been for a number of days. Hospitalizations are down uh, and vent usage uh, is down as well. Uh, and it appears that we've pretty much plateaued uh, on the daily reports of, of deaths as well, although, you know, the deaths are obviously much higher than we would like them to be. And, of course, you really don't want anything over zero when it comes to, to deaths. Uh, but, but we intend to move forward in a way that is smart, that, that protects public health, uh, and does start to reengage our economy. And what, I, what I've said uh, before, I think, uh, bears repeating now, I, I want people to have their expectations in check because phase one is a very gradual easing of the current restrictions. Um, and it's, it's not as if we're going to be opening uh, uh, just going back to where we were before uh, this pandemic struck. That's, that's not the case. And so we believe that, that when we meet the gating criteria, those, those uh, threshold criteria, uh, that we will be able to go to, to phase one. Uh, accompanied uh, by robust testing uh, and contact tracing as we need to. Yes, sir. Um, we, as we've seen the numbers continue to, to get smaller and smaller, are you simply going by the, the criteria laid out in the guidance uh, as far as relaxing some of the, the orders? And, or are there other factors that you're looking at? Uh, well, we're, we're applying our own independent thought, and we're talking to uh, folks here at the Department of Health uh, we're talking to people who are in the business uh, sector uh, in Louisiana and, and others. Um, and, and so I don't think what you're going to see is an exact, um, whenever we get to it, if it's next week or if it's two or three weeks from now, whenever it happens, you're not going to see us execute a plan that is exactly the recommendations for phase one that came from the White House, but it's going to be very close. Um, and, and I really, I don't want to, uh, stand here now and, and get in, in front of where we really are. We're still going through that analysis. We're putting together uh, the plan, and, and if we're able to move forward next Friday, by, by early next week, you're going to have me here at the podium explaining what we're doing uh, and what that's going to look like. And, and it, it just wouldn't be responsible for me to, to get ahead of that today. Yes, sir. Can you give us an update on Louisiana's effort to boost testing? You obviously said you wanted to be able to test about 200,000 people, ideally by May, maybe closer to 140,000. And also the federal government has sort of indicated uh, this is going to be a state responsibility. So what are you doing as a state to, to boost Well, that? as a state, uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure that, that we expand our capacity. And, and by the way, we're trying to expand capacity in-state. Uh, for testing so that and we will continue to 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 engage uh, uh, private labs like lab corp and quest as we need to uh, but just to be more in control of the situation we really want to rely primarily on in-state uh, laboratories and creating a spoke and, and wheel model uh, where where we're going to have uh, uh, regions uh, sending their tests to to certain laboratories uh, and to, to make sure that we are, are getting the uh, test done as quickly as possible and the results uh, known so that it can inform our contact tracing. Um, the, the, the most difficult part is not really the lab capacity, um, and, it's, and this is true for just about every state, and I, I can't speak for all of them, but I know that I, when I'm participating in the conference calls with the White House and conference calls with the National Governors Association, the problem isn't lab capacity. Uh, the, the challenges are trying to source the swabs, the viral transport medium, uh, the reagent necessary uh, to collect that specimen, have it preserved properly so that you can get a reliable uh, test result from it. And, and so we're, we're really focused on those things right now, uh, sourcing the, those items and starting to manufacture more of them here in Louisiana. Um, and we're going to have um, a much uh, a, more detailed, uh, you know, explanation from you what that looks like, but I can tell you we have, for example, some higher education 3D printers uh, that are making the swabs that we need. Uh, again, not in the number that we need them, but but this is certainly helping. Uh, we've got viral transport medium being uh, manufactured here in the state now, uh, and so forth. And so we're we are working very hard um, with FEMA because it's it, FEMA is the agency. Uh, that we've been uh, instructed by the federal government to work through to try to source uh, more of, of these materials that will help us with testing. And we feel like we're going to get to the level of testing that we need. That we need. 
So our, our goal is to be able to do 200,000 tests per month. Uh, the requirement is somewhere between 140 to 150, but we would like to get over that uh, just, just to make sure that, that we have a clear picture of what's going on uh, in the state of Louisiana. And how close are we to that 140 to 150 minimum? Well, you know, we're, if you just look at, I think we've been in this fight for six weeks. You know, I think we've done 142,000. You know, so we, we just need a, a, a slight boost more than, than, than we've been able to do over six weeks and get it in, into a month. And we've got more testing coming online every day. So this is, this is achievable. Um, and, and, what, what, and this also is under the heading of trying to manage expectations. Uh, there's a limit to how, much our, how many phases of, of the reopening of our economy we can do if at some point uh, the testing capacity stalls. Uh, but, but we feel very comfortable about phase one. I mean, that's where we are uh, right now. Uh, and then every time that we try to meet the gating criteria to go to the next phase, whether it's phase two or phase three, um, then you don't just have to meet those criteria. You also have to look at your ability at that point in time uh, to do the testing and the contact tracing. Uh, but but we're, we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. We're talking about phase one, uh, and we will be able to meet the criteria for that. Yes, ma'am. Governor, um, Senator McConnell has made some comments about um, not necessarily wanting to do much more at the federal level to provide um, assistance to states and perhaps allowing states instead to declare bankruptcy if they're having problems with their uh, budgets because of the virus. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering for, from you is, are, are you interested in, in the ability of a state to declare bankruptcy? Would you like that authority or would you prefer additional money from the federal government? And have you gotten any guidance on the $1.8 billion that the state has already received? So I think you know the answer to that question uh, before you asked it. I, obviously, uh, very disappointed in Senator McConnell. That is grossly irresponsible. Um, and the much better approach is the one taken uh, by Senator Cassidy, uh, our senator, who working in a bipartisan fashion with Senator Menendez of New Jersey, uh, has introduced a, a bill in the Senate that would actually appropriate about $500 billion, not all of which would go to states, but, but much of it would, uh, with tremendous flexibility so that states didn't have to do things like declare, declare bankruptcy. Um, and have massive layoffs and, and, and other things uh, take place. That is obviously a much more responsible uh, path forward. And I'm heartened to say that publicly the president has agreed that, that in the next phase of, of coronavirus relief coming out of Congress, uh, that states should be included. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the president's view wins out uh, and that Senator McConnell has a change of heart on this uh, because, it, it, you know, it would, it would just be uh, horrendous uh, for states to have to declare bankruptcy. And by the way, I'm not standing here saying that Louisiana would have to declare bankruptcy without any help, but to say that, that we would rather or that he would rather see a state declare bankruptcy than receive uh, help uh, is grossly irresponsible. Uh, secondly, the uh, guidance from the Treasury's office came today uh, on the $1.8 billion, uh, which is the state's share of, of the CARES Act, um, and it's for expenditures only. It's, it cannot make up for lost revenue, um, and, but, but it does have significant flexibility on the expenditure front, um, and that's something that we were looking for. There's still some questions, uh, and it is our intention to honor the uh, the spirit of it and, and what we've been asked to do by, I think, every single member of our congressional delegation, uh, and that is find an allocation formula whereby 45 percent of the money uh, will be allocated to local government, uh, 55 will be retained, uh, 55 percent, I should say, retained by the state. Uh, that's easier said than done, and when the money goes to the local government, they will be um, under the same obligations as we are to only spend the money uh, on approved expenditures uh, that have been incurred uh, in relation to COVID-19 and not to make up uh, for lost revenue. Um, Some and states have said that it's so, it, the rules are, are not flexible enough and that they will end up having just to return the money because there's not enough flexibility. Is that something you see for Louisiana? Or? Uh, 
we will do everything we can uh, to bring that uh, money to bear to address the problems related to COVID-19. Uh, I have had no conversation with Secretary, I'm sorry, Commissioner Darden about returning any part uh, of that money. Um, and, and, you know, it could be, and first of all, it would be premature to, to say that um, because it remains possible that, that in subsequent acts of Congress, uh, they can retroactively increase the flexibility as it relates to the $1.8 billion. And I can tell you that continues to be a major focus of the National Governors Association. Maryland Governor uh, Larry Hogan is the chair. And every time we talk, which is at least once a week, uh, we're making the case uh, to Congress, to the President, to the Vice President about the need for more flexibility. And so we will keep m making that case. In the meantime, we're going to take the guidance as it is and have the very best plan for the state of Louisiana. Yes, sir. Um, so yesterday you um, encouraged the people of Louisiana to start wearing masks yeah. when they go out. Um, we all in here are masking up, like you asked uh, yesterday. Um, also yesterday it came out that uh, Harris County, which is Houston, is going to fine people for not wearing masks. You either get fined or you spend some time in jail. Uh, your thoughts on that and with so many more, what seems to be so many more people out and about now in the last week, could we head in that direction, or is it just too early to say because of well, how this is spread? I think you're going to see some, some um, more uh, on this next week uh, as it relates to what happens after April the 30th. Uh, I will tell you, it is not my inclination at present uh, to start uh, arresting or finding individual members of the public for not wearing a mask, although I'm absolutely encouraging everyone to do that. Like I said yesterday, you know, it's, it's, it's like opening a door for somebody. It's being polite. It's being considerate because when you wear a mask, you're protecting someone else. And when they wear a mask, they're protecting you. And that's what we should do. But you are likely to see uh, requirements that if you want to run a business and, and have folks come in from the public in order to purchase goods or services from you, then, then your workers ought to be in a mask. Uh, and, and so that is more likely to be in the order as a, as a requirement uh, than the public. Uh, but, but, you know, we need people uh, to exercise common sense and to understand that, that we're not asking people to wear N95 masks. We're, we're, we're asking them to wear a suitable face covering. There are all sorts of ways to do these. You can do them at home, and, and, and we're going to be providing a lot of information about this. Um, and, and we're going to be distributing significant numbers of masks uh, through parish OEPs that will be available for uh, distribution as well. Uh, but the masks are, are a central component of making sure that we slow the spread. Um, and, and so we're, we are going to be, uh, on the one hand, in, in certain circumstances, directing their usage, and the other is to be highly encouraging them. But I, I, don't, I don't see us getting to a point where we're on the streets arresting people who, who don't have a mask on. Last question. And by the way, I think the way the, the uh, people of the United States and Louisiana are seeing this whole issue around COVID-19, if you want to successfully reopen your business, you need to be protecting people from COVID-19. And they're going to expect to see that the cashier is wearing a, a mask. If we get back to where you have dining uh, on premises that the waiters and the waitresses are wearing a mask. The people who are stocking shelves are wearing a mask. Otherwise, you're going to run the risk that people are not going to come in your store. And so this this is this is something that we think uh, the business community is going to largely take care of on its own because they're going to want people to be comfortable coming back uh, in, into their stores. Now so, last question. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, Governor, you said yesterday on the call with your uh, uh, economic task force or commission yeah. that uh, you guys are going to be deviating from the White House plan in some respect, the White House mm -hmm. guidance in some respects. Can you talk about why that is? We obviously have a higher death rate here and it may be riskier. And also, like, what exactly you're deviating from the guidance on? Well, obviously, there'll be more information that on next week if we get to the point where we're ready to go to phase one. And I'm making that announcement. 
but we've already made announcements that are different from the from the White House. Um, so in the White House uh, guidance really looked at taking non-emergency medical and surgical procedures and reopening those as part of phase one. Well, we issued the order um, already uh, through LDH to do that. And one of the reasons we do in that is because we are less healthy than people elsewhere and we want them to be healthy. And so if you want people to be able to take um, themselves and make themselves healthier, they've got to be able to go to the doctor and get treatments for hypertension um, and, and for diabetes and, and other uh, conditions. And, and so that's, that's really a, a big part of this. We also know that the longer people put off routine things, the more likely it is that an emergency develops relative to that uh, health condition that, that they're putting off treatment for. And so in consultation with hospitals uh, and with various um, uh, medical professionals across the spectrum, um, the LDH uh, came to me and said, look, we, we think this makes sense and to go early, so, so we did that. That deviates, uh, as I mentioned, from, from those guidelines. And I think you're gonna, see, you're gonna see some other deviations because quite frankly, there are some things that we're just not comfortable with that they ought to be part of phase one, that they would be uh, much more in, in line with, with phase two, uh, for example. So, so you, there'll be more information on that on Monday, and if, and if I try to get more specific than I just did, then I'm kind of getting ahead of where we are because we're still going through this analysis. There, there's nothing easy about what we're doing. It, you know, it really hasn't been done uh, before. We're, we're working in concert with our partners at the CDC and, and, uh, and, and talking to healthcare professionals across the spectrum here in Louisiana. Um, and, and look, I, we're gonna do everything we can to be smart about this and, and to get it right. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll make a few mistakes, but because we're going to be testing and monitoring, uh, we'll, we'll pick up on, on mistakes pretty, pretty quickly and, and working with the business community and, and other stakeholders, uh, we just believe that, that we're going to be in pretty good uh, position uh, to move forward. And, and I would tell you that what we're doing isn't necessarily inconsistent with what the president put out because what he put out was the it was guidance it was guidelines it, he wasn't and he was very clear about this he wasn't making decisions for governors he said governors will be the ones who are in control of what they do and when they do it here's some guidelines as to what we would like you to consider um and and i i said the day they came out that they were very reasonable uh they were very consistent with the discussions we had already been having here uh, at GOSEP, uh, and, and so the, I think they're very helpful, and they're things, you're going to see a whole lot more things that are in conformity with the guidelines and things that are, that are not. Uh, so, so with that, I want to thank you all again for being here today, uh, and I'm going to encourage the people of Louisiana uh, to be encouraged uh, and to know that we are going to get through this, uh, and, and we're going to do so by being good neighbors to one another. It remains essential. Uh, that we follow the stay-at-home order. Um, it is in effect at least until April the 30th. Uh, I'm asking you to make sure you minimize in social contact, stay home if you are sick, continue to wash your hands frequently with soap and water, use hand sanitizer when you can't control your cough. When you do go out, keep your distance from, from other people at least six feet and wear your mask. Um, do all of these things that we've been talking about. Let's continue to make sure that we're heading in the right direction so that we can get uh, to phase one and, and start gradually uh, reopening uh, our economy, getting people back to work, getting businesses uh, back open. Uh, and, and, uh, and I just encourage you to be, be focused on this and, and, and be determined. Let's all do our part. Um, there is a role for everyone to play, and it is extremely important that everybody play that role. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do. And I want to thank uh, all the people out there who have been doing so well. Um, it is it is not lost on me and, and every night when, when I say my prayers and I'm, I'm, I'm thanking God for our blessings one of those is that we are not anywhere close to that trajectory we were on a month ago with case growth that was actually leading the world uh, we are in a much much better place because of the people of Louisiana and, and if we will just continue to behave in this fashion it's going to get better as we move forward uh, and we will get through this uh, uh, in better shape than we otherwise will. And, and the most important thing is that we minimize the number of people who are dying. Uh, and if we minimize the spread of disease, we will minimize 
the deaths that we see. So thank all of you very much. I will see you tomorrow at, at 2, 2.30. 2 I'll see you at 2.30. Thank you very much.